Hello, today we're going to talk about cross-site request forgery. So what is it? On the right side, you see a web application. It's called mail server, right? It's like Gmail, Outlook, some web application. On the, on the left side, you see the user that wants to use this application. So all is good. Uh, in order to start using the application, the user logs in with a post request. If you're confused about post, get, an HTTP protocol, check out a previous video about web application fundamentals. In order to continue here, we have the post request, the user logs in, and then the server, if the user is authenticated correctly, sends back a cookie with the set cookie HTTP header and the cookie name and the cookie value. So then this flies back to the user's browser and then the browser stores that, keeps it safe. It will only ever share this cookie again if the user visits the same site, so it doesn't share it with other domains. The next request the user performs then is the user wants to read the email. So they issue a GET request saying, hey, give me my inbox. The browser automatically sends the cookie. The server can authenticate the user. It knows it's the same user. It can auth it has authorization, right? And it sees, like, grabs the email for the user and then sends back the email. And so the user can read the email. That's how web applications typically work. What is the attack now? So this is cross-site request forgery now. So we have the same mail server, we have the user using the application, and now we have the third player in the game, we have the attacker. The attacker crafts a link. So the attacker figured out the mail server is vulnerable to cross-site request forgery. The attacker crafts this link saying, hey, visit this one URL, right? It points to the mail server and initiate and has a couple of query parameters. It's a very simplified scenario. It's a GET request, right? HTTP GET, and it has query parameters. One is the operation, delete. The other one is item number 100. So that's what the attacker sends to the victim, right? And it, the attacker might send this via an email, via an ad, when the user browses, via a Facebook post, whatever. The, the goal is the attacker tricks the user to visiting that link. The user then visits that link, right? It's sort of this proxy that that, that performs the attacker's request across the domain. So the, the attacker was not on this domain before, but the user clicks that link and the user is authenticated, right? Cookie will be sent over to the mail server and this operation delete one item 100 will be succeeding. So the attacker is actually deleting items on the user's behalf. This is cross-site request forgery. At a high level, right? The problem here is that the user agent, the browser, sends this cookie automatically, which causes the user to be authenticated. So that needs to be mitigated by the developer. Important for the attacker is without cross-site scripting, in addition, the attacker cannot read the response. So this is only applicable to modifying state on the server. So if there's a creation of an item, an update of a record, or a deletion of a record, then an attacker could possibly have negative impact with cross-site request forgery. This scenario here that I walk through uses a GET request, which a GET request, according to the HTTP specification, should never change state. So this is usually a simplified scenario. But you might find, and this is what something you to look for, is if you can find a GET request that causes st uh, state changes, because that is very bad. So in reality, you're most likely looking for POST requests, right? The form POST whether it's the browser issues a POST request to update or have like a JSON payload, uh, payload and that sort of thing. So let's look at this example, if it would be a POST request. So you can understand how an attacker crafts a malicious POST form payload. So it would be just an HTML page of HTML form element with an action, and that points to the API the endpoint on the web server the attacker wants to talk to, then it, you can specify the method, get or post, that the browser should issue. And then you have this very important thing called the ENC type. And this is the content type that the browser will issue the request with. So there's going to be an HTTP header saying content dash type. And that says application x www dot dash form URL encoded. And then the attacker can specify all these various query parameters they want to specify in the post payload, like ID, name, and in, this, in our case, we only would have an ID, delete an item ID. But this can be a very complex structure with hundreds of elements or with 10. So very important to understand that 
the attacker can modify this request accordingly to, foot, to, foot, to fit the API specification. Closing the form tag, and then a very tricky thing that is sort of neat is do an attacker might actually basically auto submit this form. So it's very seamless for the user. The user just visits the site, put the site for split seconds loads, auto submits itself, and that's it. You know, the user has been compromised at that point. So that's the HTTP form post scenario. And how does this look now? So the, the flow is a little bit different, but this is much more realistic in how the attack usually works. So you have the mail server again, the mail application, we have the user, we have the attacker. The attacker now also has a web server, so they need to host this form somewhere, the HTML document that we just see. And in this case, it's called attacker server slash csrf.html. So that's the document we just um, authored in the previous slide. Again, the attacker tricks the user, hey, to visit his own web server. Now the user clicks the link, it goes to the attacker's web server to download or the attacker's web server host this HTML document that we just uh, built in the previous slide. So it hosts this on the server and sends it to the client because the client wanted to have it. So now what happens is the browser will auto submit this form, right? It will submit this form to the mail server slash API delete. And in the body, in the post payload, it will attach all these query parameters of the, of the HTTP form, like the ID that we specified. And the same as before, the browser, since it, the user was already logged in to this cookie, uh, to this mail server, and the browser has the cookie, the browser will just happily pass on the cookie. And that compromises the user's inbox and deletes an item. So this is how you will see this described or performed in the real world, typically. Many bug bounty findings I have had were this, especially in this category. So cross it request forgery, very, very common problem. So let's talk a little bit. So this is the high level scenario. So at this point, you should understand very well what the problem is, how it works. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about more intrinsics that I figured out over the years on the scenario on how to effectively or efficiently see if there's a problem or not. One thing to look for is the content type. So if you observe the traffic of a web application, you can see the content type header flowing back and forth. And what is important now, a very first thing that I'm often looking for is, is the, the content type actually can a form post issue that content type, right? If it's, what we have seen with the ENC type, you can specify the content type, but you can only specify very limited amount of content types. And these are the three you can specify. Application form post, multipart form data, which is usually a file upload. So you can do file uploads and text plane, which is very generic. Most notably here is that the content type that cannot be set by default is application slash JSON or SOAP plus XML. So this makes it sometimes difficult to invoke or to try to invoke a REST API because those are usually application slash JSON. But often, and this is very important, you can use the content type text plane, or even you can modify the request so it's a form URL, a form URL encoded payload, and then it just works. So this is something you should always look into if the server fundamentally enforces the content type. Another mitigation you might often see is an explicit anti, and this is the correct mitigation, anti cross site request forgery token. And we'll talk about this in a second. Another thing to look for is, is there an authorization header present? Because that often mitigates this issue. Uh, and there's bypasses, of course, which I'm going to talk about in a second as well. But if you have an authorization of basic, right, basic authentication, then the application is usually vulnerable because basic authentication, if the, the browser will cache the user's password and auto submit it, submits it to that domain. So you have the same problem as with the cookie versus with the bearer token, it's more complicated. The bearer token needs to be manually attached by the developer of the application from with JavaScript usually, and then an XML HTTP request is issued that attaches that bearer token. So those two things are something to look for. Remember basic authentication problem. 
And the topic that is very important in this overall discussion is cross-origin resource sharing, which allows a developer to kind of have a lot of fine-grained control what requests and what HTTP headers can be attached or modified from which calling domain. So this allows to open up that you could also have another domain, for instance, send you a content type of application slash JSON. So not just the hosting domain can issue that request, but also like any other domain. And so this is something to look for. I'm not going to go into really a lot of detail. I can do another session if you're interested in this topic. But it's important to understand that to look for cross region resource sharing to see if there's anything that is widened or opened up permissively so that you could actually bypass some of the mitigations that are being put in place. In particular, there's also this origin header, with, which again, the browser with a form post couldn't send or modify. But if the web server says, hey, is there, is there an origin header present, then a regular form post might not be able to invoke it. Now let's talk about XML HTTP requests. This is a more advanced scenario that there's a weak course policy an attacker might be able to exploit. So we have the HTML document as before, then we have the script tag, and then the attacker builds out the request. So it's a payload, which is the JSON payload. We, we, in this case, the item we want to delete is item 100. So we create an XML HTTP request object in the browser. We open the API, or we tell it to connect with a POST request to this endpoint delete. And here you could also specify, now you could modify the post to a delete, for instance, if that's how the application would behave. That's all possible with XML HTTP request that is not possible with, form, with a form post. Then you can set a custom content type, right? application slash JSON. And this is another question. Will the course policy allow that or not? And then you know you just lock the response, and, and then you send off the payload in the browser. And that's it. So when the, when the attacker tricks a user into visiting this page, it's going to perform a cross, or it's going to, it might perform a cross-site request forgery attack. But what we don't know at this point is if the browser, if there's a course policy that allows the browser to do that. So by default, this is not possible. And this is sort of what I want to show you now. So if you, dish, if you would issue this request and the server does not have a course policy, you can actually see exactly this message. Uh, message. I got this in Firefox. It says cross the region request is blocked because the same origin policy is allowing the remote uh, resource to be accessed. So this means that the attack is not possible. But if the server says now, you know, allow anybody to access this or allow the content type to be modified from anybody, then this will actually succeed. And in the real world, you will actually find applications. So something you definitely need to try out. So let's talk about mitigations briefly. The best mitigation, and that's also what one thing you can look for immediately, is if there's a, a dedicated anti cross site request forgery header present in the application. So there's sometimes a token thing, X anti C surf or C surf token. If that is present, the, the developers at least thought about this problem deeply. The other thing is, you know, a content type header, as mentioned, often sort of by accident, I would say even mitigates this problem that you have a content type that cannot be sent across domain with a form post and there's no course policy. So then most applications sort of are mitigating this this way, not really knowing even about this problem. So sort of an effective <laughs> mitigation to some, but it's to some extent, but it's kind of a weak one. Similar, a custom HTTP header that the browser just can issue the authorization token with a bearer scenario, right? All of the, these are mitigating the attack unless there is a course policy that you know, weakens this mitigation. From testing point of view, which probably interests most of you is, the first thing is to open the app you know, and see how authentication works. Is there a cookie involved? Is it a REST APIs with bearer tokens? Just observe the traffic. Then do you see any GET requests that change the state? Right? We've seen earlier, GET requests should never change state. If you find one of those, you probably already have a bug because that's just not good and can lead to CSERF very quickly. Then review the content type of you know, modifying request types. You know, is there a create, update, or delete request? 
that has a content type of a form post, because then you know you can probably uh, issue that API call with a cross-site request forgery attack, right? Then what I usually do if I think I have a problem, uh, or I found a problem, <laughs> then I look for, you know, just taking the working request and just trimming it down so it looks like a form post initially. So try to remove every header that I the form post couldn't issue and see if it still works. So kind of working my way to the repro that scenario. And if it looks like it's going to work, then I just built the HTML document. And in Burp, you can actually even say, hey, build me a payload. But I always prefer doing this manually because you learn a lot on, by doing this yourself. Yeah, and then try with different content types. Application slash JSON, text plane, right? There's this thing is invoke it with a different content type, see if it works. And there's some tricks you can construct valid payloads with, for instance, with text plane, you can construct an XML payload or you construct a JSON payload. That does tricks, and I can teach you those if, if you ever have a problem in this scenario that you found you can invoke something with text plane, but you just don't know how to make it look like uh, an application, a uh, JSON payload at this point because you know, the browser will still, from a form post perspective, it will still include like the equal sign. So you need to work around that. That might be a, something you don't quite understand why I'm talking about it right now, but when you investigate this, you will run across this, for this problem. And there's easy, easy ways to, to work around this. And then you can also try to morph the content itself. So you can change not just the content type, but you could change the actual content from one to another. Like for instance, you can change, uh, form post payload to to a JSON payload, or you can j change a JSON payload to a form post payload, and sometimes that actually succeeds. So you just restructure the way the data looks into a different data structure and see if that works. And yeah, if you find an anti CSERF token, which most often or often you will find if it's a more mature application, there's a couple of tests, right? Remove it, retry the attack, change it, retry it, and then a very important test is also to use, use it with two different users and take user A's token and use it with user B. And if the application doesn't bind the CSERF token to the user session, you have a bypass because you could create your own token, use your own token to submit it with the, with the user's request. And that would bypass this. So there's a lot of uh, kind of hiccups and it's, it's often working and developers don't realize that they made a mistake somewhere around the lines. So this is sort of high level thoughts and perspectives. There's a lot more to dive into, but I hope this gave you a good overview on what cross-site request forgery is and how you can investigate and look for this kind of vulnerability, which is a very common vulnerability. With that said, yeah, everything you saw, right? SSL and TLS will not protect from this attack and also a firewall will not protect from this attack. With that said, thank you very much for listening. I hope this is useful. Let me know what topics you would like me to cover, any kind of deep dives on some of the things I've been talking about. Subscribe to the channel and give me a like, uh, share the information if you find it useful with others and have a great day.